welcome to the Real Estate Zone and I'm sitting here with Reese Rock. Uh, Reese is the Managing Director of FWJK. Uh, FWJK are leading property developers, uh, particularly focused in the area of mixed-use property development. Um, they also do quantity surveying, um, they also have architecture team, they've got a project manager team, uh, and uh, essentially there are new leaders uh, in the game and they're doing some iconic developments uh, right here in Johannesburg. So we, Reese, first of all, uh, welcome. Thanks, Neil. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about FWJK, where did it all start, what do you guys do? All right, yeah, thanks, uh, Neil. So FWJK came from a quantity surveying background, uh, established in 1953. We practiced as professional quantity surveyors for many years. It was in 2001 when we ventured into property development. Dave Williams-Jones, practicing as a QS, would undertake his own property developments. He did this during the 80s and 90s for his own account uh, and through a number of processes and interactions with other consultants we embarked on property developments where we would develop property on behalf of investors and other end users. The first large property development that we did on behalf of an end user was with Goba Engineers in 2001. We had a site on the Amschlange Ridge. Mm. Gobo were an engineering firm and they wanted to own their own offices. They didn't want to pay rent to a developer mm -hmm. uh, or a landlord and they didn't want to pay the traditional developers 30 or 40 percent profits. And that's really where the co-development methodology came from. We okay, didn't so I want to stop you there because it's quite important. Tell us a little bit, about, let's elaborate on this because this is the start of history, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Well, I think it's I think it's important to understand the story of where we where we came from. Okay. So with Gober in 2001, we entered into the transaction on the strength of a handshake. FWJK took the development role. We were paid a fee of 3.75 percent of the capex. Uh, to date, we haven't changed that fee. We haven't been greedy, and we've got a model that that works. Mm -hmm. Now, with Gober, that particular building in Amschlange Ridge was 2,000 square meters, the potential building. Mm -hmm. Gober needed 1,000 square meters, and Dave Williams-Jones took the other 1,000 square meters on risk. He divided it up into five uh, 200 square meter sectional types of offices. He ended up on selling it for profits. In 2001, you could make a lot of money from selling sectional types of property. Essentially, the process that was followed, there was a shareholders agreement adopted between Dave and Gober. We hung around for five years afterwards mm -hmm. to answer questions about snags, having successfully developed the building and unsold the, the five 200 square meter units. Mm -hmm. We then went into uh, a holding pattern. We didn't realize quite what we had done mm -hmm. in, in 2001. It was only in 2008 when Gober approached us again. And at that stage, they wanted to be in the Ridgeside office park in Amschlange. Right. Now, yeah. in uh, Ridgeside, they were the engineers on behalf of Tongot Hewlett Developments, mm. and they wanted to be on the highway in the precinct. Now, the only site uh, that was available to us from Tongot Hewlett had a bulk of 3,500 square meters. Mm -hmm. The Gober consortium only needed 2,000 square meters, mm -hmm. and the 1,500 balance posed a challenge for us because the banks at the beginning of 2008 were not lending a cent to anyone, certainly not to go and build speculative sectional title offices. Now, Dave and I were driving around uh, on a Sunday afternoon and we saw a broker's board on another site. Now, they were selling uh, office space at uh, 20,500 Rand per square meter. That's uh, excluding VAT, mm -hmm. uh, but including uh, everything else from your basement parking, A-grade finishes and the like. Now we knew as good little QS's mm -hmm. that a building like that, like the one Gober wanted, would cost about 14,000 a square meter. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we went, we went back to Gober and we said we, can, uh, we believe we've got a solution. We costed it, we uh, got our architectural friends Alfred Proom to draw up some rudimentary architectural plans. Gober had their 2,000 and the 1,500 we divided up into about 12 sections. Those 12 sections we took back to the broker who was advertising the property up the road at 20,500 on behalf of another developer. And we said, go and see if you can sell this office space mm -hmm. at cost, mm -hmm. at 14,000 square meters. And we said, tell the buyers that they will pay between 13 and a half and 14 and a half thousand a square meter, mm -hmm. uh, depending on when the final costs come in. Right. And we sold out within a week. 
well. Then we knew that we created a method of uh, ensuring our own survival as a firm of quantity surveyors. Mm. And, and from then it's really just mushroomed and we've continued to replicate that model mm. of creating professional work for FWJK. Yeah. And ultimately that was our drive at the beginning because at the beginning of that, of the financial crisis, was really tough times for yes. consulting firms. Mm. Mm. So we did this as a, as a means of survival. And not to be arrogant, but no one else could compete with us. Another developer uh, who wants to sell office space can't go to the bank and say that he wants to do a project and only make 3.75% uh, profit. The banks will laugh him out of the door. But whereas FWJK are happy to earn that as a professional fee mm. for the development management services. And we've created essentially a new niche for ourselves as professional developers rather than traditional sectional title developers. And we now develop on behalf of consortiums of investors, sometimes for our own account and sometimes for individuals. And the building we're sitting in right now is our new FWJK office in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. 16,000 square meters of sectional title office space on that model. Uh, and the co-developers here have paid 24,950 rands a square meter. Mm -hmm. uh, and the investors who bought with us who are now on selling to the market at market rates, which sit around 34, 35, 36,000 a square meter expat, are then enjoying uh, the arbitrage of the 10, uh, 10,000 rand a square meter in the traditional developer's profits. And yeah. it represents a very compelling, almost irresistible opportunity for investors. And obviously the same goes for the end users who would otherwise have to buy from a developer where they'd be paying the profit. So let's maybe just go a little bit back to where you made the big change because um, it's not a traditional model where we see quantity surveyors moving to property development or property developers moving to quantity surveyors. It's, it's, it tends to be a construction company and they yeah. outsource that kind of function. And uh, I mean, that kind of model, is it, how was the transition? Into that. The, the transition was a bit scary, uh, to be honest, Neil. We, we thought at the time, in fact, we knew that we'd be biting the hand mm -hmm. of other developers that were feeding us work as quantity surveyors, and we thought we would lose all of our work. So it was a bit of a risky transition mm -hmm. for us. And as I say, we, we, we didn't do it intentionally. We didn't necessarily have a planned goal of being where we are today. Mm -hmm. The model has just has grown and it, it's seen in the numbers of staff. I think in 2008 we didn't have much more than 20 staff in total. Today we are at 259 staff, 192 of whom are professional university graduates mm -hmm. and the balance of support staff. Mm -hmm. And that's made up, as, as you've said, the development managers, architects, project managers, quantity surveyors, chartered accountants, interior designers, um, and other construction-related built environment professional services that we need to run as a group. Yes. So maybe just talk about you, because you based, uh, you started off in East London, moved KZN. That's right. Uh, now you're in Cape Town, you're in Johannesburg. Just, just talk about some of the developments that you've been done and how that transition happened. Because it's quite recent that you've got to Cape Town, but you're very busy there. Yes, both Johannesburg and Cape Town are fairly recent, both opened in the last five years. Right. And it's just the natural progression of where we were headed with the model and the opportunities that we sought to provide our services in those major metropolitan areas. And there's obviously a demand for property and to date we've concluded around about 4,500 individual transactions with individual co-developers. And some of those guys are onto their 17th or 18th purchase with us on, on projects. And I think that demonstrates the track record, our track record and the and the success of the model. So, we're sitting right here in Johannesburg and uh, your head office is here now, we're sitting at Elova Point and uh, right across over there we've got uh, another mixed-use development uh, in Lobo Central. Maybe you just want to share some other developments before you got here and I know you've got more because I know as a developer you've got to have a constant pipeline of, of mm. developments happening through. So maybe Johannesburg, where was your kind of your first big one and uh, sort of and where have you moved and where you going? Well, our first big one uh, in Johannesburg was our Great North Industrial Park uh, by O.R. Tambo Airport. That was uh, 15,000 square meters of industrial mini factory units. Right. Uh, and just um, as an aside, to just give you a bit of uh, background on the diversity that FWJK has, uh, there's virtually no property that we can't develop mm -hmm. uh, because it's the same skill set mm -hmm. of design and management um, that's required. So from medical suites, uh, retail, residential, industrial, commercial, uh, we've, we've done it all. 
right. uh, not nuclear power stations and bridges. Yes, yes. I want you to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, your at cost uh, development uh, model that you offer investors. I know you have spoken about it, mm. and, but I think it's something of interest and uh, I think maybe, I think it, it deserves to get a little bit more attention. Okay. Uh, what would you like me to, to well, tell you? Well, I think, I think we're talking to an investor uh, mm. group out there and I think it's something that intrigues them and it's something that some t sometimes bypasses people in terms of what is actually what's on the offer. So maybe you want to just talk a little bit about, because you mentioned you had a number of investors coming on, um, you know, what is the kind of investor, what would, let's talk about uh, the, the entry level type of investor, a million bucks, is it two million bucks, mm. are you just looking for a cash injection over what period of time, that kind of thing? Each, each investment is project specific, right. each uh, development uh, is ring fenced into mm -hmm. a shelf company and each of the buyers, they become shareholders in that development company. So it's like a traditional sectional title developer. but instead of buying from that traditional developer, you're essentially buying from yourself. And that's the quid pro quo, is the deposit, normally around 25%, is used as equity by the development company uh, to implement the development. FWJK manage it from cradle to grave, uh, we arrange the funding, and then each investor is required then to put his 25% equity in and sign surety for his pro rata portion of the development bond that we arrange from the commercial banks, uh, Investec, uh, APSA or Nedbank. Each shareholder ho holds a pro rata uh, PQ, that's a participation quota for those of you who don't know. Sure. And they are only responsible uh, for their limited slice of the pie and they only pay the actual cost to company. Mm -hmm. Now the typical investor, generally it's a, a, an individual who doesn't necessarily have the time the expertise or the wherewithal to develop property himself mm -hmm. and due to the uh, smaller end user space requirements it's often impossible you can't go and develop a 500 square meter office in a lower mm -hmm. uh, you're forced to buy from a developer who's building a big building yeah. and people can't develop a, a building like this because of the uh, it's cost prohibitive uh, to do it by themselves uh, at a development cost in this one of 500 million. But they can become a part of a consortium buying property at cost. Right. Um, and it's not syndication, mm -hmm. it's not share block, mm -hmm. it's a traditional transaction between the investor's end user purchasing entity, it could be his family trust or a PTY Limited, and uh, he buys it from himself. He right. gets a sectional title deed, becomes a member of a body corporate, and the property then uh, flows into the normal life cycle of the property. So, as, as a developer, you know, you've got to have uh, developments coming online at the time. Mm. Um, and uh, this is the latest one that you've got. Um, any other things? Because I think if we're talking to investors, you're also looking for land. Is that right? And, and, uh, Correct. We do, we do look for land. I think our trump card is being in a position, because we're developing at cost price, to afford the landowner a healthy land price. And that enables us to secure the hottest hottest pieces of land in the right nodes and I think that's crucial for us is ensuring that we propose developments in nodes with a buoyant rental market. Mm -hmm. Crucial to investors to make sure that the tenants that are going to come into that building uh, are able to pay the rental and that the returns work. Yes. Generally on uh, an ungeared basis, an ungeared first year return on investment, we are anywhere between 11 and 12%. Mm -hmm. That's just net income in year one versus your capital development cost, which is, it's above market. Yeah. Eight to 9% mm -hmm. uh, is where you would see your return on investment coming in if you bought a sectional title property from another developer. And that's the power of the 30% developers profits that the, that the investors and end user occupiers that come in and buy it on the co-development model basis, that's the advantage that they get. Rhys, maybe you want to share a little bit with the audience, where, where do you see FWJK in about 10 years? And uh, I know you've alluded to also looking beyond South Africa. Mm. Maybe you want to share some of the, how does the future look? Well, you know, certainly for us, there's uh, very uh, exciting and appetizing opportunities overseas. Uh, we're looking at Perth, uh, London and New York and have really made strides uh, in those markets in terms of Is getting to understand the market. Is there a reason for that, uh, for those areas? We just, we, we feel they are nodes dominated by traditional developers. Uh, where our model of the, what we refer to as the FWJK co-development at cost 
development methodology is not seen in those areas. And we think there's a huge gap, particularly in the likes of London. We both get our lift from China, but the price of property and the rentals in London are 10 times what they are in South Africa compared to the cost. So right. uh, it makes a lot of sense for us to uh, look at those markets. Right. It's a 10 to 15 year horizon. Right. Uh, we, we're here in South Africa and we've got a lot of work. Right. Just in, uh, as an example, in Gauteng alone, mm -hmm. uh, we have files open on 47 new projects. Wow. Um, yeah. and, it's, and it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and we've got a very good staff. Mm -hmm. What I've learned is that uh, in today's market, there's no shortage of energetic, young, clever property professionals. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of flat land mm -hmm. in Gauteng, mm -hmm. uh, and there's no shortage of demand. Mm -hmm. 10,000 people a week arrive yeah. uh, on Gauteng's doorsteps as economic migrants. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge demand for, uh, for business, for residential accommodation, and for office accommodation. So it seems that almost FWJK, because we, we saw in uh, what, 2010, just after the whole construction boom of the Soccer World Cup, we had all, they called them the Big Five construction mm. companies. You fill the gap, of which they've kind of left behind. Would that kind of be an accurate statement? Well, I think the construction companies, Neil, um, are generally not developers. A lot of them tend to stick to their knitting. Uh, and, and build, but uh, the 2008 financial crisis wiped out a lot of developers. A lot of developers went, went bust and I think a lot of people are very cautious. I think, and that's, that's the advantage of the co-development methodology at cost price, is that it's recession proof and it's a great place to put your money when you are, when there's uncertainty in the market. Mm. You know, the, you can get 8% in a money market account, mm. you could get 15% maybe on the stock exchange, mm. or negative 15%. Yeah. The bricks and mortar, or the glass and concrete uh, that, that we develop, uh, our annualized returns are anywhere from 40 to 60%, and that's based on the profit mm -hmm. equating to the cash on cash of the equity that you've got to put up. So maybe you just want to share in closing to the investors out there, give them some ideas because you've also invested yourself in mm. some of your own projects. That's so, right. Which gives, I think, a lot of people confidence because they say, well, if you're investing, uh, it sounds like a good model, I'm going to invest. So maybe um, you want to give a couple of ideas. Um, I don't like to use the word tips, maybe principles as such, but uh, or uh, of, of what people could do to, to, to get involved directly with it. Well, look, firstly, just to elaborate and talk to your point, FWJK has skin in the game on every single one of our projects. It's been fundamental for us as the development partners. All of the other shareholders in these developments and the buyers want to feel like we have the same interests mm -hmm. and that our interests are aligned. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been fundamental to our success. Right, right. In terms of tips, location, location, location. Yeah. Yeah, which we are in the middle of Santon here. That's it. Middle yeah. of Santon, you want good nodes, particularly, you know, in, in Gauteng. Look at the booming nodes of Menlin in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got Rosebank down the road, Alovo here, mm -hmm. Santon, mm -hmm. Bryanston, mm -hmm. uh, all very active areas, and those areas are on the rise. And even Joburg CBD, from a point of view, uh, and the rejuvenation that Herman Mashaba is pioneering. Right, so that's also on the, on the horizon as well. That's it. Yeah. And then in terms of uh, getting in touch with FWJK, it's quite simple. Our website's mm -hmm. fwjk.co.za mm -hmm. uh, and people can contact us directly. Excellent. Well, Rhys, thank you very much for the opportunity and, and uh, good luck for the future. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot, Neil. Yeah.